So what we're going to do this week is uh, build on a few of the hacks I shared past week, uh, particularly looking at writing hacks. And we looked a little bit at Google Docs, and I showed you how to structure and format um, the outline of you know the body of a, a, an essay in Google Docs to help you get that formatting stuff consistent and sort of not have to worry about it. What I want to talk to you right now is about how to actually do the research that you're going to need to fill it in. And we're going to use Google Docs and a few other tools, especially when it comes to citing the research that you've done. We're going to talk about a couple different ways to sort of simplify your life when it comes to doing that kind of scholarly writing where you need to be citing work. So let me quickly share my screen. Uh, and what I want to show is a paper that I am actually in the middle of writing. This is a research paper. I'm going to submit it to a journal and get published. So you may not be doing that, but you're going to be writing a research paper for a class uh, at some point. And particularly if you decide you want to keep going in academics and you want to go to grad school, you're going to be doing a lot of this. These are important skills for you to learn. So this particular paper I've been writing in Google Docs, and I followed all the other tips that I gave you about how to format the headings, uh, you know, so that when I click on them, I can easily update the headings and I get my uh, table of contents basically auto-generated over here. Now, how do I go about finding research to uh, include? In this particular case, I'm writing about something called micro-refuse sampling, which is sampling archeological sites really tiny bits of debris left by people. Think of like crumbs after you make toast, but with other kinds of artifacts, little sh shards of broken pottery or uh, little bits of stone tools when you're sharpening them, it can all be preserved, right? So that's what I'm writing about. So you can definitely go to the library and we're going to have a um, whole module on library resources. And there are special, uh, databases that you can search at the library, and you can also use their OneSearch tool. So we're going to get to that part of it. But let's say you want a general purpose tool and you just want to get some initial work done. Well, I always recommend starting with Google Scholar, and you literally can just type in scholar.google.com. And I believe I showed this to you uh, previously, but what we can do within Google Scholar is type basically any kind of keyword that we want, and we get a, a whole bunch of results. It searches through uh, the journal indexes themselves, but also it has the ability to look at, um, I guess, third-party hosting uh, organizations like academia.edu. And it not only can find you the source, the link to the actual journal article, but if there's a PDF copy, you can, uh, it will often find it. And if you're logged in to your SDSU stuff, it will also draw on our library subscriptions to different journals and offer you PDFs through that access, in addition to some that are just available for free download on various places on the internet. So this is a super useful thing. And um, actually, if I'm telling the 100% the truth, I tend to use Google Scholar more than almost any other tool to find original research. Now, what's really cool about Google Scholar, again, you can do keyword searches, but you can uh, constrain the, the time range. So in this case, I've clicked on things since 2018 because I really wanted to find recent research. I know the literature from the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. I wanted to see what's been published recently on this topic, micro refuse analysis. And so I've got this list over here. So firstly, again, I could click on the PDF and uh, you might not see the window that just popped up, but it was a download window in this case, or I might open in your browser and you can look at the PDF if you want. So that's one way to do it. You could also click on the title of the article and it will load up the website. Um, of the publisher. And if the full text is available here, for example, here's a PDF download link, you can download it that way. So that's really great. Uh, you'll notice that it will load in the same tab. So you might wanna right click and say, open a new tab. Um, so for example, this one, if I open a new tab, this is the article over here. Um, this particular journal is antiquity and you got all of this kind of stuff. You can even in this case, read the full text of the article just in your web browser. 
or it does give you the option to download or save a PDF file, which is kind of convenient. Um, so let's say I read through this article and I want to I want to cite some information from it. So I read down through here and I want wanted to use this concept of tax tasks. Hey, look at this. They cited me. How nice. I just noticed that. Fun. Um, anyway, they cited this, they are talking about this concept of taskscape. So let's say I wanted to cite that. I wanted to take that idea and use it in my research. So I'm in my paper, which is over here in my other tab, and I'm down in here and I'm talking about how have other people used it and I want to write a thing about uh, um, these folks over here. Their name is, uh, let's see, who is it? Uh, Antolin, Sabinov, Naumov, and Soteras. So um, in this case, there are four authors. And so we're going to use a convention known as the et al convention, which is Latin for and others. Okay, so we're going to use the first author's last name, Antolin, et al, and these other folks. Okay, and it was written or published in 2020. So uh, I'll just start off. Taskscapes is a concept introduced by Antolin et al. Notice the period after the all. And then I would want to put a parenthesis for the date, 2020. And it is blah, blah, blah. A little definition in my own words, right, of what taskscapes are. So what you see here is an in-text citation. In this particular case, I'm mentioning the authors by name in the sentence, so I use the last name. If it was one author, I would just use Antoline and I would not have the et al. If it was two authors, I would write Antoline and uh, what was one of their other names? Sabanov. So it was just the two of them, Antoline and Sabanov, and I wouldn't have the et al. 2020. But if it's three or more, the convention typically is in, in most citation formats to use the et al there. Now, since I'm talking about them by name in the sentence, when I cite them, I only have to put the date, 2020, in parentheses. But let's say uh, uh, I have another thing that I want to talk about from that article. This concept is useful in blah, blah, blah context, you know, da, 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 context. And that's something that uh, the Antolin et al. paper said. I didn't make that up. They said it, so I need to cite it. So here I open up my parentheses and I write Antolin et al. 2020 fully within the parentheses. The two main different ways that you cite. Now, if I'm quoting, literally taking uh, some text out of there, let's say um, I'm in here and I want to I want to copy this sentence verbatim into my thing. So this is the next one. Antoline et al. Say or 2020. Say, and then I open up my quotations and I paste into place, so just use my control V to paste into place like that. Now, what I need here, the only thing different I need here is a page number, actually. So I have to go in here and I might not get pages on the HTML version. So I may have to download the PDF to find out the page number that that appears on. But let's say it appears on page two of the article and the article is actually starting from one. Sometimes articles start you know, they're in the middle of the journal, so they might start from 225 or something like that. But let's just say it's two. In the end, uh, in this particular case, because we said Antolin et al. 2020, say, and I should have a comma there, blah, 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 blah. And at the end of this over here, before the quotation mark, I need to put another parentheses, P2, right? Alternatively, if I don't want to introduce them with the Antoline at all, uh, I just want to go right into the quote with no introduction. I, at the end of this, but within the quotation mark, I put the, oops, sorry, Antoline at all. 
2020, comma, P2, all within the parentheses. So this is uh, called in-text citation. And you have to look at the citation style uh, that your professor asks you, or if you're submitting to a journal, what their style guide is. Um, this is a common one. It's based on a, a, a common format, which is, I'll show you here, uh, APA in text citation style. There's also MLA. These are two real general ones. And then Chicago, Harvard, Vancouver are all pretty common. But each journal might have its own particular style. So you're going to want to look that up and see what the style is. So I just gave you a little hint about what to do next. So now I've got all of my citations in here. And you'll notice that in the rest of the paper, I have other citations here, 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 etc. What I need to do is at the very end of the paper, um, I need to have a works cited list. Now, there are two different things. A works cited list are literally only the works that you have as cited in the text. A bibliography, which is the second thing, could also include works that you don't directly cite, but which inspire you or you found useful. Depending on the style of writing, you may only have a work cited. You may only have a bibliography. It's very different. If you're writing a book and you don't really want to do the in-text citing, you better have a bibliography with lots of sources listed, and then people just will assume your information mostly comes from items in the bibliography. But for journal articles and for most research projects at the upper division level, you need to cite in the text and you need to have a work cited in which only the things that you cite in the text appear. You can also have a separate bibliography below that with additional sources, but the two need to, generally speaking, stay separate, okay? So let's say I wanted to cite the Antolin et al. Uh, article. Well, here I am on the journal website where I was reading it. I could uh, just try and uh, look up the style guide, which is how he said we had a we had a book that we looked up the style guides in, and we would put all the things, the names of the authors, the date, the title, the publisher, and we could type those in. Do not spend your time doing that. It is not a good use of your time. Even if you're just here, you can click on the cite button, and depending on the journal, it will give you different formats, and you can just copy this to the clipboard by clicking here, and then over here, you can right-click and paste, and there it is. Now, this may not be formatted the way that you want, so probably an even smarter way to do this is if you used Google Scholar, use that little citation panel that I just put up. Every single entry in Google Scholar has this cite button down here, and you can choose between the five most common citation formats, and literally when you click on it, it highlights all of it, you copy, and then you can go back over here and paste. Boom. So excellent. One resource, super easy to do that. Five resources, super easy to do that. What if you have 10, 20, 30? Well, these have to be in alphabetical order. And then if it's the same author, within the author's little section, it has to be in chronological order. So you have to go through and copy and paste and copy and paste and move things around. And it's really easy to mess that up, okay? So I'm gonna show you two uh, ways that you can get a perfectly formatted bibliography that will be in the right order. One of the ways is simpler and the other way is much more powerful and probably more useful to learn in the long run. Let's start with a simple one. We're going to use two tools. They're uh, both by the same organization called Zotero. The first one is the complicated, more complicated one. It's just Zotero. It's an actual citation manager software. And I'll talk about that second. But first, I'm going to talk about Zotero Bib, and it's called zbib.org. That's the website. So you just got to go to that website, zbib.org, and it's pretty straightforward. All you do is to paste in the URL uh, or, or any of these other identifying numbers. Each article will have something called a DOI or digital object identifier. Each book will have an ISBN, which is a library number. Um, 
and it will start to compile a bibliography for you, no matter what order you paste those in. So here's Antoline et al. back again. And I'm just going to copy the URL, the, the link at the top here. I'm just going to right click and copy it. And here I am back at zbib.org. And I'm just going to paste into there and hit cite. Now, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to see a citation right here. And then at the bottom, it says bibliography. And there it is. So I have a couple other articles about micro refuse up because I'm doing my research. So I'm just going to use my quick uh, control C for uh, copy and uh, control V for paste, just to speed things up here. So I put the next one in, I hit cite. This is the next article here. And you can see it put it in order in the bibliography. And uh, here's a third one over here that I'm just gonna copy, control C and paste, control V. And then I hit enter in that case, and it's gonna do it over here. So now I have three articles. And let's just add one on something totally different that I was researching earlier, uh, just so I can have a nice four of them. And you can actually see how all four of these articles are now in the right order, A to Z order. And if I had multiple um, articles by the same author or authors, it would put them in chronological order in that section. And you can see by default, it's formatted as MLA. Well, I can click here and I can change it to APA very quickly. And they'll say, oh, we have to change titles to sentence case. And you know, you can either do it manually or whatever. So click that. Uh, and not only that, it says 10,000 other styles. Well, you can click there and let's say I put in anthropology. Oh, there's the American Anthropological Association, which is a common citation format that your professors might ask for. Click add. And now within my list of things, I have the American Anthropological Association and it has formatted it in that way. Now, what's really great is once you've added all your sources, let's say you have 10 tabs open for all the different resources that you're gonna use in your paper and you put them all here, you just copy it to the clipboard like so, go back to your paper. And so I'm gonna just delete what I did before. I'm just gonna right click, paste, and there it is, right? Uh, in this particular case, I'm gonna have to go in and fix some formatting uh, because the AAA formatting might be weird. Um, so I might have to like delete that one uh, and uh, you know delete over here. So if I don't like this formatting, I'm having a hard time, maybe I'll just pick a different one, right? So let's find the APA that's the one that I tend to like. So copy the APA and control V and there it is, right? And again, um, in this particular case, you know, maybe I have formatted for double spacing. So I'll go back into here and go to single spacing. And all of a sudden it looks better already, okay? So that's pretty straightforward. If you have a small number of, uh, you know, 10 to 20 or so, and it's possible to copy and paste each URL into Zotero BIM, that's super easy. But the problem is maybe you want to save these citations and reuse them in future papers. You don't want to have to go find the URL every time. Well, that's where Zotero comes in. So here we are at Zotero.org. Now, this is a piece of software that you have to install on your computer. And there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, I'm having to use Zotero on Linux. So there's my download. If you're using Windows or Mac, you'd have a download there. And then you also have to install this connector for your browser so that you can cite stuff in uh, Google Docs, but also to scrape the citations out of um, Google Scholar. So let me quickly change the screen because I have my Zotero installed in the back. So you would install both of these two things, but let me quickly change my screen. So I'll show you what uh, Zotero looks like. So here's Zotero. Now I have a I don't know, several thousand citations in here because I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but you have a main library over here um, and you can have these things called group libraries, which you may not need at the moment, but you can share a Zotero library with another Zotero user. Your main library is where you're gonna keep most of your stuff. And if you click on any one of these, um, you see the information here uh, is you can add or delete these columns. This is just for sorting. 
But over here is the information. Here's the title, here are the authors, the publication, the page, the date, etc. And you'll notice that some of these things have a lot of information, like the whole abstract. I did not type that abstract in there. In fact, I hardly ever have to type anything directly into Zotero. Zotero is just going to organize it for me. Uh, I will show you in just a second how you can scrape this information right out of Google Scholar or right out of a you know a journal web page. But uh, just briefly, one thing that you can do in Zotero is within your library, create little folders over here. So here's a little button to do it. And now you can start to organize your citations. So if I have a paper that I'm writing on um, micro refuse, here's my micro refuse collection. I can do uh, this organization. And now when I import a, a, a reference about micro refuse, as long as I have this folder selected, it will organize it here. And it will always also just be in my general library. So you can search um, by author. Literally, I can uh, I can search for, um, let me search for my own name, just uh, in the field over here. Like so I hit enter and I can find all the papers that I've written and published over the years. They just show up because I put them in Zotero earlier. And I can also search by keyword, micro refuse. And I can find a bunch of articles that specifically mention micro refuse, right? But once I uh, sort of found and imported the articles, it's a lot easier if I just create this folder over here in the left. And you can see I've done this hundreds of times. And then uh, all I have to do is to drag and drop, literally click, drag and drop this over. And uh, if I let go of this right now, it would make a copy of this in that folder. No, I don't know if I really want that one in that particular folder, so I'm not gonna do it. And you can see I can be very organized. Each paper could have its own folder or each subject area that I'm working on could have its own folder. And uh, I can very easily kind of click on any of these things and see the state of my research. Uh, basically, what are the, all the articles that I found? And what's really cool is that you can actually log the PDFs in here. Um, Zotero will scrape and save the PDFs in here. And also, you can like literally just double click on something and it will take it, you open either the PDF or it will take you to the web page for that particular article. So it's super, super, super useful okay Ooh. so let me share back my uh web browser and uh, uh what i'll show you is firstly how to scrape the citations automatically so zotero uh is the the program i just showed you zotero connector is an extension for your browser and it will show up up here this is chrome It'll show up a little differently in Firefox and, and Safari or something like that. But it'll show up right here as a little icon. This is the Save to Zotero icon. So if I'm here in uh, Google Scholar, this has the little icon has changed to a little folder because I have a whole, uh, oops, I closed Zotero in the background. So hold on. You have to have the Zotero application running in the background. So just give me two seconds to... Start it up again. Um, just wait for, I gotta wait for it to pop up again. I'm only sharing, it only lets me share the one window. So Zotero will pop up in the background. You won't actually see it. So just give me a minute for it to actually load. Apologies. I don't want, it to, want you to see this. Um, in fact, I'm not sure if it will even show up for you once Zotero is loaded because it might pop up in a slightly different window and I might have to share it. So I'm gonna click this button here and uh, a new little window has popped up called the Zotero item selector. So let me just see if I can share that screen. Okay, so this is the Zotero item selector and each one of these is one of the search results on this particular page of the Google Scholar results. And I can just click all of these things like so, and um, click OK, and the window closed, so you see me again. And if I go back to Zotero, uh, it has added those resources in here. So in fact, here's the Antoline et al. that we were just looking at. Um, it has imported into Zotero. Cool, all right? Now, 
how do I use that while I'm writing? So let me share back again. Zoom really makes this uh, annoying, this process, but we're gonna do what we gotta do. Okay, so share. So just before I do that, I could also have gone here to the journal page and clicked this little button in the upper right and would save just this one citation um, too. So you can bring the citation in multiple ways, but it'll bring it into Zotero. And now, once I have the, the Zotero connector installed, you might notice that here in Google Docs, I have a Zotero um, menu item now. It just it lives as a, a, a plugin. So let me delete this one I made earlier. And let me go up here to where we were talking about the Antoline et al. Uh, stuff. So somewhere up here, uh, right here. So um, here's the one that was uh, the normal full parenthetical. I'm just going to delete that so as you can see what I'm going to do. I'm going to click on the Zotero button, and I'm going to click Add Edit Citation. Now, um, you might see Zotero is updating your document. A, I have to log into my Zotero account. The little window has just popped up here that you can't probably see. So I logged in, and I'll just show you real quick. Let me switch the windows so you can see what pops up. Okay, so this is the quick format citation and I can just start typing the guy's name, Antoline, and it will find it uh, right here, Antoline and all in my library. Now I happen to have it in there twice. So I'm gonna wanna delete that eventually in my Zotero, but I'll just click it. And now there's Antoline 2020. And when I hit enter, it's gonna switch out of this because the window will have closed. So let me then reshare uh, my, my Google Doc. Okay, and there it is, Antoline 2020. And now when I highlight it, it says edit with Zotero and I can go in and edit it. So I'm gonna click edit and the little window is gonna pop up again. I'm gonna switch my screen over to that. So I'll show you one important thing that you're gonna to wanna to know. So just two seconds. Okay, so here's the quick format citation window again. If I click on Antoline, I can omit author, and that's just gonna make it 2020. And I can put a page number, page two. So now I have it. I'm gonna hit enter and then reshare the doc. And there we have it. In this particular citation format, it's a colon and then two for the page number. But you can see, so I would have to have written Antoline et al. here, 2022, right? Now, I've got a few other Zotero citations in here uh, in the beginning. You know, I'm just sort of starting this. I don't have a ton. But I'm going to take you to the very end of the paper in my works cited area. I'm going to put my cursor down here. And under Zotero, I'm going to click Add Edit Bibliography. And a little progress bar has popped up that you probably won't be able to see. And there we go. And now if I wanted to, I can click Zotero and I can uh, do that again and or go to Document Preferences. And let me share that window real quick. Takes a minute every single time. OK. So now I can choose all the different styles. Now I have imported a whole bunch of styles. Um, you'll want to do a little um, research into how styles in Zotero work, but you just download a little file and you bring them into your Zotero, uh, your standalone Zotero. And then you can choose whichever one that you want here and click OK, and it will reformat the paper. OK, so basically that's the my my sort of slightly more in-depth hacks for how to do the research and then cite the research in a smart way now the cool thing about using zotero the most complex of all of those is that all your citations once you add them they're always going to be in there you can always get them get back to them and use them again and again and again without having to copy or paste to move them around and once you've done that in the article Let's say you know, you've know you cited it as APA and your professor or the journal says, oh, sorry, you need the AAA format. Instead of 
pulling your hair out and screaming that you have to go in and reformat, you know, 50 citations by hand, you literally click a button, select AAA, and it updates everything in place. Super, super easy. Not only that, you'll find that Zotero becomes a study aid, a research aid in and of itself. Once you start amassing a whole bunch of citations for a body of literature, you can start to powerfully search through them. You can make notes in them. You can annotate them. You can make little collections. You can share your collections with a research team. So you can do a whole bunch of stuff with a tool like Zotero that helps you, again, get further down the line. Now, if this all seems like TMI right now, I get it. But put all of this in, you know, off to the side, save this video, it's on my YouTube, you can go back and look at it. And eventually, I promise you, before you finish your undergrad, and especially if you go into your grad, you're going to want to do this. The faster, the sooner you make this transition to working this way, the easier it's going to be, the less uh, annoying it's going to be to have to switch over. You don't want to wait till it becomes uh, like a major task to do this, because eventually, you're going to have to do it anyway. So you might as well start out the way that you want to go, get a little bit of pain right now and a lot of gain later on. So that's basically it for now. Uh, please read the other document about how to write for anthropology because there's a lot of additional tips in there as well.